So welcome to uh, session two of the Design History Society Publishing Workshop. We're delighted that you could join us today. Uh, the session will address the theme of academic publishing from submission to acceptance. And we have a fantastic lineup of editors and publishers who are all going to speak around for around seven minutes about how this theme relates to their publication or publications. Following these papers, we're going to have a 20 minute discussion in which the editors and publishers will answer questions submitted by you, the audience. You can submit a question in the chat at any time during the papers. And just also to let you know that we'll be recording the papers today, but not the discussion which follows. So now moving on to introduce the first speaker, uh, Grace Lees Maffey, who is full professor of design history and program director for D Heritage the Professional Doctorate in Heritage at the University of Her Hertfordshire. And then she's also chair of the editorial board of the Journal of Design History, which is going to be at the focus of her paper today. Grace researches mediation, heritage, national identity, and globalization in design. She's the author and editor of numerous books, including Design at Home, Domestic Advice Books in Britain and the USA since 1945, and writing design, words and objects. She co-authored with Nicholas P. Maffei, Reading Graphic Design, and also co-edited Made in Italy and Designing Worlds with Jetil Falan, as well as Design and Heritage, The Construction of Identity and Belonging, and the Design History Reader with Rebecca Howes. Okay, Grace, over to you. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, so uh, thanks for asking me to come and talk on the topic of academic publishing from submission to acceptance. And I'm going to start um, with a cautionary note in that the title implies a very easy and straightforward journey in which acceptance is inevitable. But of course, not all submissions end in acceptance. In fact, the minority of submissions end in acceptance at the Journal of Design History and uh, acceptance rates vary else uh, um, around um, the academic publishing field. So I just want to insert rejection into this title um, and having done so, um, I'll then tell a more positive story about from submission to acceptance. Uh, so the Journal of Design History was launched in 1988 and um, it embraces uh, a range of subjects from furniture to product design, graphic design, craft, fashion, textiles, architectural interiors and exhibitions. Those are all listed in the front of each copy of the journal. And I've put that at the beginning of this um, talk because it's important to reflect on what you want to say in a submission and how well it fits your target journal. There needs to be a really good fit. You need to see in the descriptor for your journal, um, your work fitting well into what the journal's trying to achieve. Um, so <clears throat> that statement at the front of the journal goes on to talk about methods as well. So we can think about areas of design and methods as being captured in that statement of intent from the journal and how well your work fits into it is key. So we have four issues a year, publishing about 24 articles a year, for instance, and um, two review articles were published in addition to 24 uh, research articles last year. And each issue carries about 10 reviews. We also have other formats. Um, those of you familiar with the archive will know the archives curating and collections um, pieces. Um, some shorter pieces were published under the title Refocus Design um, years ago. And we have had a few obituaries and the Design History Society translation, uh, which is part of our globalization initiative. So we have a range of formats um, into which you would want to You're on my stuff. insert your work. So um, not all of our material is in the pages of the um, journal. We also have a lively website that's chock full of content. And some of it, um, for instance, our virtual special issues is born digital. 
uh, you can see the top 50 most read articles there. Um, and there has at various times been a comments capability, which is underused, I think, so far. Um, so the Journal of Design History, coming back to that issue of scope and, and how it needs to be a good fit, uh, has um, a couple of aspects which distinguish it from other design journals. And you're going to hear about some of those other design journals uh, in a moment. It is, con it, it, we're brave enough to use the word history in the name of our journal, um, unlike some other journals. Um, and I think that that's really significant as a distinguishing feature. And also we have a gold standard review process, which you can't assume um, will be the case in, in every journal. So we uh, have moved recently from four peer reviews for each article or manuscript, I should say, to three uh, for a number of reasons, but three is still a good number of peer reviews to help you develop your work. So um, thinking about submission, it's critically important to meet the submission guidelines to the letter. Everything you do right preempts a hiccup along the, along the process. So I'd urge everybody to follow those very carefully. Think about um, how much work you can actually fit into an article that's five to 8,000 words. So cutting your coat according to your cloth um, or, or whatever the idiom is, is something I would recommend. Um, Things that get turned away pretty rapidly are things that are obviously a student essay, a chunk of a thesis, a conference paper, all of those things um, don't fare well. It needs, you, the thing you submit needs to look like a Journal of Design History article more than anything else. You need to articulate a clear original book original contribution to design history. So the, the work needs to make an original contribution and articulate an original contribution, uh, citing relevant sources, drawing conclusions based on evidence rather than conclusions that are not based on evidence and be written in clear English. And that may require professional assistance. So this is a screenshot of the submission um, site that you go into, Manuscript Central, and there's some um, help available there too. So once you've submitted your work, um, our managing editor um, will uh, look at it. So the editorial assistant looks at it and then the managing editor looks at it. And the man one of the managing editor's roles is to assign an editor based on um, expertise in relation to your manuscript from the editorial board as a whole. Um, and then the assigned editor will select reviewers um, based on expertise relevant to your uh, manuscript and also thinking about perhaps including some early career researchers where relevant so that we're developing the reviewer body all the time. And um, the peer review process is monitored by the managing editor and um, part of that monitoring um, takes the form of roundtable peer reviews that occur at our editorial board meetings um, sometimes. So I thought it might be interesting for you to see the um, peer review questions that reviewers answer. So they're asked to rate for quality, they're asked to recommend um, a level of work that needs to go into it. I should say that um, immediate accept is virtually unknown. Um, so it's most often going to be minor or major revision. And the reviewers are asked to comment on the um, originality, the clarity, the argument and use of evidence, uh, written English, um, whether it's been published elsewhere or not, because we will only publish unpublished work. And if the paper might give offense, so a kind of legal, a legal heads up there. And so um, I've mentioned the VEA check and the manuscript going to the managing editor. There can be an immediate reject at that point, but if it goes to an assigned editor, then three reviews will be obtained and a recommendation written and then um, a decision letter. So this is that process in diagrammatic form with slightly different language. When it says final decision, that's the final decision on the first version. 
uh, because there will normally be a revision, R1, which does it goes through the same steps, VEA, uh, a managing editor, assigned editor, and the same reviewers will see it. Um, rather than us changing the goalpost by sending it to different reviewers, we are consistent in the main as far as we can be. So I just wanted to say a word because I feel quite strongly about this, about feedback, because, um, you know, our reviewers are critical in a good way and uh, it can be demoralizing to have to make revisions to work that you've already considered yourself is sufficiently finished to submit but that feedback is gold dust and every criticism can be turned around into an action point so what I find very therapeutic when I receive revision um, notices is to make a spreadsheet that's you know make a spreadsheet and that turns into a checklist that you can tick off um, and it also helps you very much in writing a response in which you explain how you have met the requirements. Um, so for us, the ideal scenarios are always ones of improvement. So a major revision for the first submission would become minor revision or major to accept, minor to accept. Um, but what we don't want to see is a major revision on the first submission becoming a major revision on the second or a minor revision. And we don't want a first submission of minor revision to become major revisions. Um, so once your um, decision letter from your managing editor um, uh, reaches accept, you move from editorial to production and will receive, um, you know, uh, communications from the copy editor um, at some point, a chance to respond to corrections. And then it's pretty fast to advanced access um, there, thereafter, it's not like the olden days when you had to wait for a space in an issue, you do still have to wait for that, but um, your work will be published much, much sooner um, online. And that's really my kind of uh, fast and dirty submission to acceptance story for you today. Thank you very much, Grace, for that very informative um, paper, which is sort of very helpful, I'm sure, for people who are already familiar with the journal and those who um, are just learning about what happens at the Journal of Design History. So our next speaker, um, I'm pleased to say, is Libby Davis, who's a commissioning editor in the Academic Visual Arts Department at Bloomsbury Publishing UK. She works on a list of design books ranging from more theory-based books to student and practitioner skills-focused texts, covering topics such as design history and design studies, craft history and craft studies, ceramics, illustration, graphic design, typography, and visual communication. Thank you very much, Libby. Hi. Um, so I'll just start with a slide, which just gives an overview of what I'll cover throughout this presentation. Um, I'll give a quick run through of our publishing process up to the point of getting, getting a contract to write a book and I'll highlight things you'll want to consider when thinking about developing a pro proposal. At Bloomsbury we publish a broad range of design books in both print and digital formats. These are published as part of the academic division under the visual arts in print um, and our list of design books ranges from more theory based books to student and practitioner skills focused texts. So firstly, this is just a quick timeline of the whole book publishing process from idea to published book. There are various stages of reviewing and revisions to ensure that the book is meeting the needs of its readers and that it is a valuable publication. Once you submit your proposal, it'll be assessed by the relevant editor who will, off, who will provide feedback. Um, they might recommend some changes before peer review. Um, and then once peer reviewed, the editor will discuss feedback with you and if all seems positive, it will be taken to a publishing meeting for approval. Hopefully then we'll be in a position to offer a contract if all approved and then we can discuss timings for the writing period, production and publication. Choosing a publisher. So I thought I'd just highlight some things that you might want to consider when choosing who to approach. Publishers have lists of books in certain areas, um, so we'll think about how your book might fit within our list, and you'll want to approach publishers who already specialise in the area that your book will be in. Bear in mind that the process of publishing a book usually takes at least a couple of years, 
often a few, so you do want to feel comfortable with the team you'll be working with and contacting regularly with questions. You want to know that your book will be in good hands and that the publishers will take the necessary steps to peer review and produce a valuable publication and steps to reach the right readers. So here are a few slides about developing your book idea, filling in a proposal form and the submission process. When developing your book idea and filling in your proposal form, you'll want to be able to clearly articulate what kind of book this is. Is it a research text? Is it a textbook? Is it a summary of a subject area or a practical guide? Um, who it's for? Is it for students, scholars, practitioners, perhaps a mix? Um, or is it more for a general reader? And if so, an academic publisher might not be the right publisher to approach. Um, and also you want to articulate why readers might want this book. Will it be to expand their understanding or support their scholarly research? Will it be to pass a course or learn a skill? And um, this will just need to be clearly articulated in the form. Um, the proposal form really needs to give us and reviewers the best sense of your project. So on the form, um, you'll need to include obviously a title and it's best to have a title that gives a good idea of what your book is about, that isn't too vague, um, that includes keywords that will enable your book to be found by interested readers um, by search engines online. Uh, you'll also want a good summary of the project, so a good description that clearly outlines the book's rationale, the approach, the main themes and objectives with clear, informative chapter descriptions. It's worth noting too that the proposal should be persuasive. Uh, you'll also want a table of contents. Uh, an annotated table of contents is helpful if you're proposing an edited collection and you have different contributors. Uh, so you might want to include affiliations and word counts if they differ. Um, also, we, ask for, we usually ask for three key features, which should be short uh, and snappy and really highlight what is unique about the book. So does it include some exciting case studies or touch on any specific geographic areas? Um, also, we want to know the total word and image count, the estimated delivery date. And we also ask you to tell us a bit about competing or comparable books. So it's really helpful in this section of the form for you to highlight how your book compares to what's already out there how it might differ uh, and how it might contribute to the field and meet any unmet needs of the market. So this slide just lists a few things that we think about when assessing a proposal. Each book is assessed on its own merit and as part of the wider list and publishing program and also as part of the bigger overall market. Generally, we would think about how profit profitable the book might be, how we can reach the key readership, um, alongside production costs and price. We'll also consider things like coverage, structure, and the tone and the language used. And we'll think about a project's competitive advantage over other publications in the area. If you plan to include images, it's also helpful to let us know if and how you plan to source permissions and things like that. Peer reviewers. So most of our books undergo two rounds of peer review. Uh, we solicit feedback from experts in the field. They might be instructors, scholars, or practitioners, depending on the topic. Uh, we tend to aim for a good international mix in who we get feedback from as we sell our books around the world. And the process is always anonymous. Essentially, we value peer reviewers. Um, and whilst we're specialists in publishing, we're not necessarily subject experts. So peer reviewers can give us in-depth authoritative feedback on the content and also on how the book might be used. And once reviews are in, we'll discuss feedback with you. And if all sounds good, the next step would be to present your proposal to the publishing committee at the monthly meeting. At this meeting, the editor would present your project to other editorial colleagues, as well as marketing, sales, and directors, uh, highlighting all the great things about your book. And we'll discuss things like budgets, marketing plans, the publishing strategy, the content and other aspects like the title, which will be agreed at the meeting. If the committee approves, we would then be in a position to offer a contract. Uh, so the primary elements that an author is responsible for are these. These are often based on the proposal document itself. You will need to agree the delivery date and stick to it once contracted. One thing to be aware of is that sales and marketing start their procedures very far in advance of the publication date. So if the book slips at short notice, buyers might cancel orders and there might be inaccurate information online. Uh, you'll also need to stick to things like word count and number of images. 
as the budget for a particular extent is carefully worked out with estimations of printing costs. Uh, one thing to ensure is that image permissions are addressed early on and that you carefully plan to obtain these in time as they can take a very long time. Um, and just onto the next slide about contracts. contracts. These are a few things that we as publishers would agree to. So once you hand your final manuscript over, along with images and permissions documentation, we organise the copy editing, typesetting and proofreading. We agree to publish the book with a certain amount of time, promote via the necessary channels and our rights team will get to work on seeking translation deals when and where appropriate. And finally, just to summarise, the design list at Bloomsbury offers a comprehensive range of books in print and digital formats, including original research, textbooks, practical guides, authoritative reference works, readers which provide key readings for students, and books exploring major design schools and movements with wide geographical scope. We're always open to new proposal ideas, so please do get in touch if you'd like to discuss anything. Um, in addition to standalone titles, we have several exciting series, including The Cultural Histories of Design, which is one of our research-based series, and it features original research on the role and significance of design in society and culture, past and present. Books in this series offer interdisciplinary approaches to design and cover a range of topics. Um, some examples are Rayford Green's study of game cabinet design, Atari design, uh, Sabine Weber's book about the contributions of women throughout the youth and still movement, Jennifer kaufman Buller's History of the Urban Plan Office and Dan Havatz's Study of Modern Design in Asia. Grace Lee Smithe and Chetel Falan are the series editors, so please do reach out to them about proposal ideas if you think you have a book that might fit within that series. Lastly, I'll just mention our digital platform, Bloomsbury Design Library, um, which is a subscription-based platform for universities uh, and it offers tons of unique content featuring specially commissioned um, encyclopedia articles, lesson plans, designer biographies, and image collections, um, as well as our own eBooks. Once published, it provides coverage of global design um, from around 1,500 BC to the present day. And it's the ideal research and learning tool for design studies and other visual arts subjects. BDL's general editor is Rebecca Howes, and she commissions content for this resource. So if you are interested in writing articles to feature there, please do get in touch with her. That's it. Thank you very much, Libby, for these really helpful insights into uh, book publishing. Uh, we're now moving back into the world of journals uh, with our next speaker, Martha Bales, who's a publisher for Oxford University Press. She works in the journals department at Oxford University Press, where she works across a range of humanities, social science and law titles including the Journal of Design History. Martha has been at the press for over 15 years and has a background in historical studies. Okay, over to you, Martha. Thank you very much for inviting me along today. I'm very pleased. Um, to offer some insights on this topic. Um, as Fiona said, I'm joining you today from Oxford University Press. We're a department of the University of Oxford and share the objective of excellence in research, scholarship and education by publishing worldwide. We publish work by scholars from all over the world at varying stages of their careers across the arts, humanities, social sciences, law and STEM subjects. And I work solely on journals at Oxford University Press, managing titles in the humanities, social sciences and law. We've added to this slide a selection of our journals that may be publication venues for your work here, um, including the Journal of Design History, which is one of the titles in my portfolio. So today I'm going to give you a broad overview of the process with some observations and suggestions from a publisher's point of view. There's obviously some overlap with those points that have already been covered. Um, so I'll be spending time on some of the parts of the process where perhaps there's something different from a journal's publisher perspective. Um, and because of this, I'm actually sneaking in some points that come before submission and after acceptance, but hopefully those will be useful to you. Um, and the first thing to say is that at the time of submission, your article must be original previously unpublished and not under consideration elsewhere. Duplicate publication creates extra work for everyone involved and if discovered will result in the immediate rejection of your manuscript. You should also ensure that your article is clear of any plagiarized material 
as many journals now use automated plagiarism detection tools to detect text recycling or significant areas of overlap with previously published work. You should think through any objections or concerns that might be raised by reviewers in advance and address them prior to submission. And it's also increasingly important to consider the DE and I aspect of your work. For instance, are you citing a diverse range of references, for instance, beyond your immediate network of colleagues? If you're satisfied that your work meets those criteria, um, you'll want to think about where to publish. So you might start by drawing up a long list. Uh, you should think about the journals that you regularly read in your own research. You might want to check the references in your manuscript to identify target journals there um, and ensure that you're considering reputable titles that offer a rigorous peer review process. Care should be taken to ensure that your target journals are legitimate. Um, we recommend a service, a free service called Think, Check, Submit that can help steer you to quality journals. It's available in 39 different languages and it's worth checking out. Once you have your target list, you'll then want to narrow that down and you should consider the aims and scopes of your target journal or journals and consider whether they're the best match for your research. You would want to consider the types of article published and your personal preferences, such as publication model, speed of publication and peer review process. You might also, if it matters, want to look at the impact factor of the journal and also check the website for any innovative features that can help enhance your work. Once you've chosen your journal, you'll then need to work through a number of points before you can submit. And some of these have already been addressed, but I think they, they bear repeating. Um, so do follow the author guidelines. Make sure that you comply with ethical guidance. Your publisher should have information on this on their website. Ensure that you have the correct permissions. As I said earlier, this can take a long time. Um, so make sure you start that process early. Include acknowledgements, conflict of interest declarations, and details of funding sources where relevant. Check that references are up to date and accurate. If English is not your first language, consider having someone else check it over or edit your work and language editing services are available through many publishers. Um, you can find details on websites. You should familiarize yourself with the journal's online submission system and make sure that you submit the final version of your work. Once you've submitted your article, it will be considered by the journal's editors. Some articles will be rejected without review or desk rejected, while others will move forward to be reviewed. The exact review processes and policies do vary between journals, but I'm just covering a few general points here. Um, peer review is intended to help you improve your work. The, mass, the vast majority of papers undergo at least one round of revision. Nobody's perfect. If you receive feedback, respond clearly and politely, but do feel that you can challenge points where this is justified. Revise and resubmit is a positive result. And if rejected, don't be downcast. Don't rush to resubmit, give it time and ensure you address all points raised by the editor and reviewers. Return to your list of target journals and think carefully about where to submit next. And think about your cover letter. Are you capturing the key points and selling your research? Some journals also now allow you to submit reviewer comments from previous submissions, which can help uh, speed the process up. If your paper is accepted, however, you'll move into the production phase. And journals, again, have different methods for processing accepted articles for publication. So I'll just make a couple of general observations here. Um, one is that once you, your article has been accepted, ensure that you'll be available for the receipt of proofs. If you aren't going to be available, do ensure that the editor or editorial office has the contact details of a co-author or a colleague who can review the proofs on your behalf. Um, you should make sure you choose the most appropriate license. This might be a standard license, or it may be one of our open access licenses. Um, for this, you might need to bear in mind any funder mandates um, and REF compliance. If you are publishing open access, do make sure you understand the difference between the various Creative Commons licenses as they determine the extent to which others can re reuse and disseminate your work. Details of these can be provided by your publisher. And finally, make sure you understand your warrants and obligations. Um, once your article has moved through the production process, it will be published. Um, and as Grace said earlier, some journals publish corrected proofs online in advanced access ahead of issue publication. At this point, a DOI is assigned, so your article is discoverable and citable. And as soon as your article is published online in that way, OUP would send you a free access link that you can share with colleagues or post to an institutional web page. Um, you can also check your self-archiving rights online, so that is what you can do with your um, uh, the original version, the author's original version, and also with the accepted manuscript and details would be available online. Um, 
And once your article has been published, you can promote it. Um, and what you do may depend on how much time you have, but we do encourage all authors to consider how they can support the promotion of their work. So if you have less than an hour, um, perhaps you could share the news in a tweet and include a link to the article. Um, you might add the article to your LinkedIn profile. You might include your article in reading lists for students. Um, and you might um, mention it in uh, you might mention it in a conference presentation. If you've got a bit more time, you might pitch a related piece to a blog um, or other online publication. And again, if you're doing a conference presentation, you might include some detail there. Finally, I'll conclude by directing you to the author resources page at um, OUP Academic for information on how to prepare and submit your manuscript our guide to publication ethics, our general publishing practices and policies, a list of commercial languaging services, a guide to licensing and publication charges, and hints and tips on how to promote your article post-publication. Whichever journal you choose to submit to, it's also important to look at the title-specific author guidelines. These will provide an overview of any specific journal policies or requirements. I'd also like to point at this stage to our um, Early Career Researcher Hub, which includes information for first time authors, including covering research best practice, offering publishing tips and giving an overview of publication processes and peer review. It's also got a helpful section on publishing trends. Um, and that's my whistle stop tour from slightly before submission to slightly beyond acceptance. And I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much, uh, Martha, for sharing your perspectives from your based on your extensive experience as a publisher. We're now moving uh, away from our in-person session in Turkey to the virtual uh, papers, our two uh, final papers, which are being delivered virtually. Um, our, so we're on our whistle tips stops tour. Now we're off to Scotland, um, where uh, Paul Sturton will be joining us. Um, he is Emeritus Professor of the History of European Design at Bard Graduate Centre in New York, and also editor of West 86 a journal of decorative arts, design history, and material culture. His research is mostly concerned with British and Central European design of the 19th and 20th centuries. And his most recent book is Jan Chikold and the New Typography, published by Yale University Press in 2019. Over to you, Paul. Okay, thank you, Fiona. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me quite clearly. Is that... OK, uh, so I'm going to talk just very briefly about uh, West 86, which was created within a specific uh, college in America, the Bard Graduate Centre. And it takes its name actually from the address of the college. And its subtitle really explains what we cover, which is a journal of decorative arts, design history and material culture. Now, I should say that although we are we were created within the Bard Graduate Centre, we don't actually allow any Bard Graduate Centre faculty or students to publish in the journal. It's really a way of promoting uh, high quality research in the field that the college uh, concentrates, as I say. And this is the journal. We publish twice a year. Uh, and we're published by University of Chicago Press. So any practical information about the journal can be found on the University of Chicago Press's website, but guidelines for submission, etc. So a lot of that practical information can be found there. And I thought I would talk more about more practical, mat uh, more down to earth matters about our process of acceptance uh, and review. Now, normally, we, as I say, we only produce two uh, issues a year, so generally it's uh, more open. We don't have themed issues. At least I could have said that up until this year, because this one that I'm holding is one of our first themed issues. The theme was metalwork, and it actually has, normally we have four articles a translation and reviews, but this uh, issue, which is entirely uh, made up of commissioned articles actually has 25 separate short articles, but that is unusual. It's also a very fat issue. This has over 200 pages, whereas normally we have about 130 to 150 pages. Now we appear in print and digital, 
And we have our own separate website, which you can find online, which has a selection of examples of what we felt were interesting articles, reviews and translations. Now, for acceptance and review, we have a system which is similar to most academic journals. We uh, sometimes solicit or commission articles, but very often articles come in, of course, uh, through the website or sent directly to me. And after that, uh, they are reviewed internally by the editorial board. And if we feel there is merit, they go on to peer review. Now, unlike Grace, who said she's moving from three, uh, from four to three peer reviews, we don't have quite as rigorous a system. We have two peer reviews, and if there's any doubt, we move to a third peer review, and it's entirely anonymous, so-called double-blind. The reviewer doesn't know the author, and the author doesn't know the reviewer's name, so it, that remains completely objective. <laughs> and when we're reviewing uh, articles which come in, we have a set of questions for the reviewers, which basically go as six categories, which are as follows. Is the paper self-sufficient and complete? The first one. Does the article contain original work? And to what degree, how original is it? Three, does it make a significant contribution to the field that it concentrates on? Fourth, is the article methodologically competent? Fifth, are the documentary sources handled competently? And finally, sixth, is the language clear and unambiguous? Now, these are similar categories that you would hear in most review processes. After that, we have three categories suitable for publication as submitted sorry, four categories, uh, suitable for publication as submitted, which is extremely rare, as you will have heard. I think I can only remember one article which went straight from review to publication. Second category is suitable for, suitable for publication with minor revisions. The third is publishing, uh, suitable for publication, but requires extensive revision or major revisions, and finally, not suitable for publication in West 86. Now, normally in our description of these, we, we have a bit of flexibility. And as you've heard already, uh, we feel that it's so unusual for an article to come in to be even close to uh, being appropriate for publication, that no one should be disheartened by uh, major revisions. We have articles that have come in for very well-established professors of history, design, archaeology, and such like. And we've often sent them back to say that this article is a mess, but there's something interesting in there. It needs major revision, and we will give detailed feedback. And indeed, if we feel that an article has qualities, sometimes it will go back and forward two, three, four times before it reaches publication. And so that's just to encourage people to uh, send in their material. Now, clearly, you should write it up as well as possible. We will not consider scrappy work, but we will certainly, if we see that something has merit and potential, we are very much prepared to work with that. Now, we have, unlike many of the journals here, we have a very broad chronological range. I was just looking at the contents of this current uh, issue of West 86. One article is dealing with bronze casting between the third and second millennium before the Common Era right up to uh, aluminium works in the 1960s. But I have to say, we, like most de design history, we tend to get material from the 18th to the 20th century. We do not cover contemporary material as a general rule. There are plenty of, our, of journals that cover that. We tend to concentrate in what we see as a historical period. Uh, now, I think that gives 
a fair range. Now, as regards length, we, like most journals, we recommend that articles should be between six and 8,000 words, but we have been flexible in the past. One of our most successful articles was a piece on uh, Art Nouveau in Belgium and the Belgian Congo by a very well-established American professor. When that first came into us, it was 18,000 words, but it was so good we wanted to carry it. When it was eventually published, it was 26,000 words, but that was split into three issues. So we have to be flexible if we feel that something uh, merits that kind of attention. And finally, what I wanted to say is for many young scholars, it often seems rather formidable, even really uh, impossible to get your work published. And it's sometimes worth trying out uh, a journal to uh, suggesting reviews that may give you a taste for what we like and also the processes involved. So approach the editor, and I'm very open to suggestions for book and exhibition reviews, and a category that we carry in West 86, which is translations of primary texts from all periods. If people think that there is a source material that would be of interest beyond its own narrow field, we'd be very interested to hear from you. And that's a, a a section that we found often leads to articles by the person who has initially proposed it. So I think that may explain something of what we do. And clearly, I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you have thereafter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. That was very informative. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Stephen Knott who's a writer, researcher, and lecturer in craft theory and history. He lectures at Kingston University, and he is one of the editors of the Journal of Modern Craft, which he's going to talk about today. He's author of Amateur Craft, History and Theory, published by Bloomsbury in 2015. And he has written articles and reviews for design and culture, performance research, West 86, crafts and ceramic review. It's over to you, Stephen. Hello, hello. Thank you very much, Fiona, and uh, hello to everyone, uh, virtually and in person. I'll just uh, share my screen now, um, and if you could just let me know that it's working okay, um, that'd be gr great. Does that look good? Yeah, cool. Yes, well, yeah. Thank you, super. So I'll, I'll be quite quick about uh, the Journal of Modern Craft. Um, a lot of the things that others have said uh, apply to our journal um, as, a, um, as a kind of sort of much more younger journal. I think there's a bit more informality and slightly less rigor in our journal uh, in terms of the peer review process, uh, simply because we're quite a young journal and we're not uh, affiliated with any kind of college or uh, conference or things like that. So the Journal Modern Craft uh, was set up in uh, 2008 and is the first kind of peer reviewed academic journal uh, to kind of really focus on craft studies as its main uh, sort of bread and butter. Um, it's uh, the mission statement of our journal is very broad in terms of uh, what we define craft to be in one sense, and certainly geographies and uh, uh, sort of geographies and material are very broad. But we are looking at something quite specific when we, when we use the word craft, and that's why we've got this idea of modern craft. Um, so we're, we're interested in forms of making and design and production that self-consciously uh, set themselves apart from mass production um, and have a kind of problematic relationship with mass production. So this is kind of very core theoretical idea and it has a very clear uh, mo modern focus uh, in the sense that the chronology being mainly articles from the mid 19th century to today uh, because this was the period in which industrialization kind of becomes a sort of, uh, sort of becomes the other half of what craft is. So it's like craft, not in a kind of decorative arts tradition that Paul maybe Paul's journal deals with more, but craft is, is framed in some kind of theoretical or or practiced opposition to industrialization. And we place special emphasis on uh, studio practice, uh, studio craft histories indigenous craft uh, activities and practices from around the world, folk art, architecture, design, design contemporary art, and we bring the, uh, the uh, chronology right up until um, the present. 
These are the editors of the journal. We've got Glenn Adamson, Tanya Harrod, Ned Cook, Jenny Sorkin, and Elisa, uh, Elisa Author, going round in a clockwise direction. Uh, we're published three times a year by Taylor and Francis, and we're in our 15th year of issues. We have book reviews and exhibition reviews, uh, two, or two, two or three in each issue. And like Paul just mentioned, we have a primary text as well, where we bring usually an article, uh, uh, sorry, a, a archival text in another language to an English readership. Um, most recently, we had a fantastic uh, a translation of a Chilean, a Chilean poet, diplomat and educator, Gabriela Mistral, who wrote some beautiful comments on European craft during her tour there in the 1920s. So that's kind of some, something that's quite distinctive. Another thing that's quite distinctive is the statement of practice which is a, uh, as it says, a, a statement by a contemporary practitioner uh, talking about their work, uh, writing about their relationship to craft and making, but very much in this mode of problematizing its, its status in the kind of modern contemporary world. And here's an image from Ibrahim Said, the Egyptian ceramicist who creates these kind of rather wonderful uh, large and small uh, ceramic uh, uh, vessels. And we kind of really enjoy the statement of practice. It's unpeer reviewed. And we, we as editors directly approach makers who we find are producing contemporary craft works that really uh, push or uh, relate to fascinating issues within the world of craft, art and design. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that the uh, editorial board is, is clearly not a, a diverse uh, group of people. It's a, the journal has a very, US, uh, folk, US kind of lead, as it were. It's a dom dominant area of crafts studies scholarship. To a lesser extent uh, here in the UK, I'm, I'm talking from London, there is a kind of uh, tradition of craft scholarship too, but it's very led by uh, kind of the American, uh, we've brought a lot of our material from America, but we have also, as the flip side of that, got a very geographical breadth, a, a very large sort of global breadth because of the nature of our discipline being craft, often vernacular craft, craft from the global south. So we've had lots of contributions from India, Australia, Japan, um, and uh, other parts of the world. And some, uh, not as many as we'd like, but there have been many Turkish contributions too. Um, I've mentioned the structure of the journal already. Uh, we've got a website which you can uh, look at that's run by Taylor and Francis. I go straight to the kind of more practical things that kind of follow what other people have said. Um, the, 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 the process for us is quite straightforward. I mentioned that we're a younger journal. We don't have a institutional affiliation as yet. We uh, have to do a lot of work as editors to seek out material, which is also quite different. We don't have a massive pile of submissions through our open portal. Um, so we go about seeking out work, which is both uh, a pressure but also quite fascinating. And we often look at conferences where craft as a discipline is the subject of a panel and we approach um, uh, authors and speakers there and see if they want to uh, uh, submit their work. But so we have a kind of similar process to others uh, as um, spoken about already. Uh, first of all, you submit to us either directly to my email or through the portal. The editorial team then consider whether the article is suitable for peer review. If it is, we send it to one, usually one uh, peer reviewer for a double blind, completely anonymous peer review, sometimes two. And then it's this very simple report um, is uh, uh, sent back to us with either no revisions, minor revisions, major revisions or reject. And um, I found it uh, helpful earlier that people are shared with you what um, what the, uh, the peer review form looks like. And can you see it there? No? Yeah. So this is the peer review form that we, we have. Um, and it's asking similar questions about originality, um, a quality of academic English, whether the article is pertinent or makes a compelling argument in the discipline, additional comments, and any serious omissions. After that process, it goes to publication or the production stage. Um, the author is invited to respond to the peer reviewer's comments. 
works on a resubmission with a new deadline uh, set by us. Once that process is completed, the editorial team uh, conduct a full line edit. Then we deal with image permissions um, and finally completed files are sent to publishers and dealt with them, put through their online publishing software system, the proofing stage and the layout stage. Sometimes this can be quite quick in our case. Um, usually though, it kind of follows the same time scales that have already been laid out by other speakers today. Um, and so our journal is, because of its um, uh, non-affiliation with an institution, we go around and have often produced lots of special issues in recent years based on panels at various conferences across the world, but particularly in the UK and US. Um, and here on the screen are just a couple of examples of some really exciting special issues of more recent years, including the Middle East special issue that we had in 2020 by the v &A curator Miriam Rosser Owen, that was is really worth uh, highlighting because it showed our kind of flexibility to kind of content because uh, Maria Rosser Owen had both research articles, but way more statements of practice in her in her kind of conference that she was organizing about Middle Eastern craft. So we featured about four or five contemporary makers from Algeria, Egypt, uh, Palestine, who are working in craft uh, alongside a smaller number of research articles. And that's a really fascinating issue. And the other one on the screen was a, an issue that we devoted to new, new voices in contemporary craft, um, again, based on a, a, a kind of conference panel at the um, uh, Yale Center of British Art back in 2017 about the kind of persistence of tradition in modern craft. So that, that kind of raised some, uh, uh, some fantastic um, scholarship. Um, I'm aware that we're kind of coming to time, aren't we? We must be, and I want to leave a bit of time for discussion. Is that right, Fiona? Yes, we're actually running a little over time. So mm -hmm. you've got something really vital to add, I think. Um... I'll just let the slides speak for themselves. These are just kind of areas where we uh, sort of publish widely and are really interested in the relationship between craft and gender, uh, the craftivist or maker movement. Um, like I mentioned earlier about craft in vernacular and global contexts. This image is taken from a block printing workshop in, um, in India, uh, which uh, is in a village of, uh, uh, in the north of India where they practice a particular type of hand block printing that is protected by intangible cultural heritage. So it's got protected status. But the article fascinatingly sort of looks at all the different ways in which protecting craft also changes the way it's practiced and has its own kind of exclusion. So really fascinating article there. Um, and this is a kind of article on tourist craft in Kenya. And also we're very interested in craft and digital practice. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there and uh, welcome all of your questions and please do get in touch if you've got any questions about the general on craft. Thank you.